Okay. Last uh, last personality theory lecture of the semester. Uh, we'll talk here about uh, paranoid personality. And I'm going to keep this one short. We'll see. Okay, so everybody has a picture basically of what of what paranoid uh, personality structure probably looks like uh, in, in in more extreme contexts. Um, we've seen depictions of people who suffer from paranoid delusions in movies and on television and that sort of thing. Um, and that's essentially uh, 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 an exaggeration, intensification of, of the, the underlying uh, fundamental dynamics that characterize the paranoid personality and um, uh, this is Nancy McWilliams pointing this out that, that the essence of the personality is the habit of dealing with one's felt negative qualities by projecting them the disowned attributes then feel like external threats so what you generally see with paranoid characters is that they handle the things about themselves uh, that they don't like, um, the things that they don't like about themselves, uh, by projecting them. Now, bear in mind, defense mechanisms, you don't gen you're not generally aware that you're doing these things. Uh, you might become aware that you're doing these things over time as you mature, as you become better integrated, as you become healthier psychologically. But, but generally speaking, uh, uh, defense mechanisms occur um, subconsciously, preconsciously or unconsciously. Um, so the person handles in the in the traditional uh, uh, way of thinking about paranoid personality, they handle aggressive, generally aggress aggressive and sexual impulses, the, 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 the impulses that are problematic in civilization, right? Um, by essentially convincing themselves pre-consciously or unconsciously it's not me that that is like this it's somebody else that is like this and um, particularly with aggression the the uh, the elegance I guess you could say of this although that doesn't feel right to say that uh, the elegance of this is uh, if I'm the paranoid person and I'm paranoid because I'm uncomfortable with the aggressive and hostile feelings that I have toward people around me, toward the world around me. And so I instead uh, uh, perceive those things as coming from other people. Well, then it makes it very reasonable if somebody is being hostile and aggressive toward me for me to feel hostile and aggressive toward that person. And I'm still the good guy, right? So it actually, it actually can be, a, a, again, doesn't feel right to use the word elegant in in describing paranoia, but you can see how it kind of works for them, especially around aggression. Now, when you see these things, when you see this 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 dynamic um, uh, depicted in movies, uh, it, it's often accompanied by a certain degree of megalomania. Um, uh, a, a sense of everything being about me, I'm very important. And, and of course, from the perspective of somebody with paranoia, everything is about them, right? Uh, because what's what by its nature, it's not it's not necessarily tied to reality, right? You, you could hypothetically have somebody, uh, we'll use that example of aggression. Well, you could have, you could hypothetically have somebody uh, who is struggling to tolerate their own aggressive impulses, projects them onto somebody uh, in the environment who is not, in fact, aggressive at all. Um, and then perceives that person as being hateful toward, toward them, the paranoid person. Um, the the, uh, the 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 function, the purpose of, of this whole this whole defense mechanism, this whole mechanism, um, is to one disown the aggression, but then two allow for the discharge of that aggression 
not just in the projection of it, not just in the seeing it in another person, but by seeing it in another person, allowing you to feel comfortable with what are now justifiable feelings of hostility. Well, what happens when you begin to do this, the, 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 the way it works, it works best in the sense of, of, of relieving you of, of that, uh, uh, of making your own aggressive impulses, you, for using that as an example, making your own aggressive impulses acceptable. The only way that works is if the hostility from everybody else is directed toward me, the paranoid person, right? So um, what ends up happening is because of the nature of what the person is doing defensively, projecting, um, the perception with everybody they're interacting with who basically they're just useful screens to reflect this this hostility. Um, it, it, the, the perception of the paranoid person is that everything is about them. All this is directed toward them. Um, that that becomes less apparent when you have people who are relatively healthier, uh, kind of toward that higher functioning end, uh, uh, neurotic end of the spectrum, um, and very very obvious. Uh, when people are more severely impacted uh, and, and, and explicitly clear when somebody actually has paranoid delusions. Um, it, it is somewhat unusual, frankly, to, uh, to see you can have people who have paranoid structure who are relatively psychologically intact and healthy and mature. Um, it's not as common as, say, somebody who's psychologically healthy with depressive structure or um, uh, uh, masochistic structure or obsessive compulsive structure, say. Uh, and, and that's because the, the definitional defense mechanism, in this case, projection, is a relatively primitive, infantile uh, uh, mechanism, right? So it's something that requires that, um, well, one, that you perceive the world around you somewhat inaccurately, uh, that you perceive the world around you as more hostile, more aggressive, or more sexual than, than, you, than, than it actually is. It also uh, is predicated upon that, in, in normal development, that early experience of uncertainty of what's, what's external as opposed to what's what's internal as opposed to what's external, uh, right? Like, like that's, a, that's a normal developmental period uh, early in infancy um, as you're figuring out kind of where you end and the rest of the world begins and you're getting a sense of your own, your own agency, the own limits on your agency, so on and so forth. Um, so the, 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 the nature of projection involves a confusion or an uncertainty about the source of, of the thing that you're defending against, which is actually internal but misperceived as external. That in and of itself is relatively less healthy, more primitive, more infantile. Um, when you do find people who are fairly healthy psychologically, um, people of paranoid character structure who are relatively healthy, you tend to find them in politics, law enforcement, that sort of thing, where where that that natural sense of of caution and sensitivity to threat um, that that is so fine tuned actually becomes useful. You, you know, you can you can imagine how uh, uh, somebody who is a beat cop might benefit from having a degree of of paranoia in their in their character structure, they're they're going to be alert for um, misbehavior, essentially for hostility, for manipulation, this sort of thing. Um, and this, the, the the for law enforcement in particular, uh, you, you tend to see certain categories in terms of character structure that it, that it, that 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 characterize. Um, uh, the personality makeup of, of we'll say police officers as a, as a primary example. Um, there's a fair number of them who, who have PTSD, uh, generally from a military background, 
uh, and the function of, of PTSD, regardless of the person's character structure, personality structure, uh, PTSD is going to dispose you in the direction of paranoia, even if it's not full-blown paranoia. PTSD sensitizes you to trauma and danger, so you become much more danger alert. Those people often function well in law enforcement positions. Uh, you also find uh, a smaller percentage of people, but, but still a, a, a not insignificant percentage of people in law enforcement have uh, marked psychopathic or antisocial traits, ironically, because we think of those people as being criminals. Um, but but uh, the, the urge for control and the, and the capacity to make people do what you want, that sort of thing, um, tends to draw them. Uh, and one of the reasons why, if you are uh, a sheriff or a police chief, you always want to make sure you have a psych eval done of any applicant because you want to screen those people out, obviously, the people who are who are control focused. And then, of course, the third op, the third, the third major category uh, in terms of character structure, personality structure that you tend to see in law enforcement is is some degree of, of uh, paranoid structure. And as long as the person is well, relatively well integrated and relatively psychologically healthy, actually works pretty well. You know, that they're, they're fairly well suited for the job. Uh, they aren't necessarily as preoccupied with control uh, and are not as inclined toward getting gratification from manipulating people as a psychopath would be, but they are every bit as danger aware and danger sensitive and suspicious and sen uh, of, of misbehavior um, as somebody with PTSD. So the other thing I want to make sure I mention as we, as we get into this is uh, a lesson that I learned uh, clinically, and that is I feel like I may have mentioned this to you. Um, in one of the in-person lectures, uh, I, I, I learned um, in a pretty remarkable way. I, I had somebody who who uh, presented to me for psychotherapy, I believe by court order. And that is usually the case with paranoid paranoid structure. People who are paranoid don't tend to come to psychotherapy because they don't trust you, right? They don't they don't want to come in and tell people their personal problems because they're inclined to mistrust and assume that you have hostile intentions toward them. So generally when you see them in psychotherapy, they're, they're, they're being compelled in some way or another to be there. Um, and I, I, the, the, this, this, uh, I want to say probably early twenties guy in his early twenties, fairly prominently paranoid, uh, broadly came in and one of his paranoid, what I thought was a paranoid delusion, uh, was that the FBI was trailing him, was was monitoring him. Um, and I mean, he even took me to the window of my office and pointed out the people he thought were, were the FBI. Um, and I misread this as, I think, I, argue, I would argue most of us would, see this as, okay, this guy's paranoid. Well, it turned out, actually, no, the FBI were after him. Um, he had become involved in some business deal where, that involved a fairly substantial amount of money and moving it across state lines or something. So they ended up, they were investigating him for criminal behavior. Um, so now he was paranoid. Uh, he, there, there, there were all sorts of other things in his life. Like he, it wasn't, it, he was somebody who was paranoid who happened to be right about one of the things, right? Um, the rest of the paranoia in his life was not nearly so florid or flamboyant. It was more kind of run-of-the-mill, relatively healthy, because he was generally relatively healthy in the sense of, of, uh, of character structure. He was relatively well reality-oriented. Um, he had some relative degree of insight. And once we discovered, or once I discovered, that no, actually he really was being investigated by the FBI, he looked a lot less sick to me. Because now we knew, okay, all the other stuff that wasn't as big of a deal um, now doesn't look as severe because we know the, the one thing that looked really sick, actually he was right. Um, uh, so you can get sometimes where you can get uh, a circumstance where the person actually isn't paranoid and, 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 and there actually is a real threat. You know, somebody is stalking the person or something like that. And sometimes you can get a situation where it turns out that, 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 um, the person is actually paranoid, but there is also a threat that's real. So you need to, it, this, this is more uh, applicable to the 
to the psychotherapy class next semester. But for what it's worth, when you, I don't know that this will come up in that class, so I wanted to make sure I mention uh, when you're dealing with a paranoid uh, uh, person in psychotherapy, you got to keep those two things in mind. The other thing you got to keep in mind, not just in psychotherapy, but but managing or interacting with somebody who is paranoid, uh, interacting with them as a law enforcement law enforcement agent, uh, being involved with somebody who has paranoid structure, who is an employee, uh, being involved with somebody for psychotherapy, uh, uh, who has paranoid structure. Um, the normal response for somebody who's a good, empathic, kind-hearted person is to try to extend a hand and, and reassure the person that no ill intent is intent. It, you have no ill intent, right? That you that you mean well, and you and you're not. You, you don't have malicious feelings toward them. Um, but take a step back and think about what that sounds like from the perspective of somebody who is paranoid. The person who is paranoid perceives the the the, the outstretched hand, the reassurance that I, I I'm not I'm not a threat to you. I don't have any ill intent um, as subterfuge. You know, they they see it as well. You're you're of course you're assuring me of that. You're assuring me of that so that I relax and you can take advantage of me, or you can hurt me somehow. Um, so ironically, in psychotherapy, as an example, the worst thing that you can do is is try to um, excessively reassure the person and and metaphorically speaking, close the emotional gap. You know, uh, you, you, you want to make sure when you're when you're working with with somebody, uh, this would be one of the rare instances where you want to kind of be a little cooler toward them. You know, you don't want to be the real empathic leaning in to more, you know, kind of kind of really digging for 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 more emotional content and that kind of thing, which most people respond relatively well to. The paranoid person recoils because they feel as if you are 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 setting them up. So the way you interact in psychotherapy with somebody who's paranoid is by kind of an arm's length sort of thing, metaphorically uh, and and obviously um, literally. Uh, you know, you you fairly neutrally make it known that it's, you know, this is this is my job. This is what I do for a living. My job is to try to help. Uh, you you minimize the uh, the apparent emotional investment you have in that. Um, and you approach the information gathering um, much more carefully, uh, uh, kind of tiptoeing around the edges. Um, and be prepared to have the process take a long time. Uh, um, and in fact, oftentimes it's not unusual that the that the primary uh, progress that's made in psychotherapy with somebody who's paranoid is they finally get somebody that they kind of trust a little bit. Um, and that can be a huge thing for somebody with, who has pronounced paranoid character and is somewhat less healthy. So uh, I, I may come back to some of this if you take the, the psychotherapy class. We may talk a little bit about this, but I wanted to make sure I threw that in because I don't know that it will necessarily come up. Um, oh, and I already kind of spoke to this. You don't tend to see these people in psychotherapy because they're reluctant to see, seek help because they struggle to trust people. Uh, and they do tend to be either mandated, court mandated or something like that, or they are in such pain that they're at that they're desperate and they're even willing to do this. Those are the poor people that you want to really be careful because you don't want to to frighten them by by trying to close that emotional distance too quickly and and really set off their bells and whistles in terms of of uh, suspiciousness. Um, OK, in terms of drive, affect, temperament. Um, surprise, surprise, they they perceive the source of their distress as external, uh, the, 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 the thing that is causing problems in their life, uh, they, they tend to have limited insight into the reality that they are the source of most of the problems in their life. Uh, they tend to present as fairly uh, angry. That may not be really dramatic and overt. It may be kind of subtle and you may have kind of a, a sense of them kind of seething, um, or they may be 
overtly threatening. That's generally for somebody who is at the, at the less healthy end of this spectrum. Um, and it's self-preservative, right? You know, they perceive other people as dangerous. And so they bristle to kind of hold people at bay. Uh, people of paranoid uh, uh, structure tend to be fairly vindictive. You know, if they see you as getting a leg up on them, boy, they're going to take your legs out. Um, they, they are at a higher risk of being violent than the general population um, because the, 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 the game they're playing uh, to them is not a game. Um, you can imagine what it would be like in terms of how it would wear on your nerves if you were walking around in the general world and you experienced the, the world at large and people in particular, individuals in particular, as bearing you ill will. Um, you of course would be a little ready to a little more ready to push back. Um, obviously suspicious and uh, really easy to activate a sense of resentment on their part. Um, uh, simply because from their perspective, they're the good guy. I'm not angry. I don't have these problematic impulses. It's everybody else around me who's hostile toward me. And that's not fair. So, so the resentment comes from the sense of, of being unjustly targeted. Um, and you get a combination when you interact with them, when you get a, any emotional component kind of underneath this, this anger and irritability. Uh, understandably, you would get a pretty prominent uh, fear response simply because they are perceiving in other people the anger or whatever the unpleasant um, 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 drive is or the, other, uh, the, the aggression or the hostility or whatever. It's strong enough that they in themselves that they can't tolerate it. And so they project this strong, intense aggression onto other people. It's entirely reasonable that they would be fearful of that because of its intensity. Um, but then underneath this, generally unconscious to the, for the person, uh, for the paranoid person, um, is a sense of shame. After all, they are projecting um, things that they find unacceptable when, uh, and, and, and um, uh, shameful. Um, this is somewhat the case for somebody whose, whose paranoia is driven by the projection of aggressive urges. It's very pronounced for somebody who is projecting um, sexual urges or sexual and aggressive urges, right? Um, so, the, you know, the classic example uh, that you would get for somebody with pronounced shame um, would be, uh, you know, a, a, a young male uh, pro, you know, prototypical, this can be, I'm giving you just a particular example. Um, a young male who is intensely homophobic to the point that, you know, they've come to the attention of law enforcement for aggressive, even assaultive behavior uh, toward, uh, toward gay people. Um, so, in that case, I think I, I may, I think I probably brought this up when we talked about defense mechanisms earlier in the semester. Homophobia, one, it's a phobia. You know, the, the, the way that, it, that homophobia is used in the general culture is, is nonsense. Uh, not liking somebody because they're gay is not hom homophobia. It may be prejudicial. It may be prejudiced, excuse me. It may be prejudiced. It may be hateful but it's not homophobia. Um, um, holding religious beliefs that, that indicate that, that, that uh, holding religious beliefs predicated on the idea that homosexual behavior is sinful isn't in and of itself homophobic. Now, a homophobic person may be really ready to hold on to those kinds of religious beliefs, but there are a lot of people who hold those religious beliefs that, that, that are not homophobic and in, fa and in fact, there are people who hold the religious beliefs who don't have any particular ill will or hostility at all toward people who are homophobic. So you really got to separate separate out the religious part. Um, homophobia is a genuine fear of homosexual urges, and 
the the you you see homophobia more pronounced. You see it in in the general population, but you see it particularly pronounced and particularly problematic for somebody who already has a disposition in terms of paranoid character structure, paranoid personality structure. Um, they're they're primed to be susceptible to this, um, and it what it derives from is they have these urges, which in fact we know um, uh, it's been pretty clearly demonstrated that people um, across the spectrum of sexuality, from a hypothetical uh, homosexual end to a hypothetical purely heterosexual end. Uh, we know that people all across the spectrum have uh, uh, some degree of sexual response to both sexes. Now, generally, somebody who identifies strongly as heterosexual uh, is not conscious of whatever degree of, of attraction he or she might have toward the same sex. And oftentimes, that attraction is sublimated, so it's experienced as non-sexual. Um, and conversely, the same thing for somebody uh, who is that, that hypothetical pure homosexual person who has no heterosexual, no conscious heterosexual impulses whatsoever. Uh, what we know from the from research is, no, in fact, they can find themselves sexually attracted to somebody of the opposite sex. Again, often not at a conscious level. So that dynamic is present ac across the range of the population. Almost everybody has that to some degree or another. Uh, um, some people have a fairly significant pronounced degree of, of attraction. Um, we'll, we'll talk in terms of the general population. So we're talking in terms of people who, are, who identify as heterosexual. We know a fairly substantial subset of people who identify as heterosexual have relatively frequent and or strong uh, degree of attraction toward people of the same sex. If you are somebody who already has some degree of paranoid uh, personality structure and or are raised in a culture, a, a part of the country, say, or in a religious culture, where that is strongly contraindicated, um, you are more likely to attempt to deny in some way that, that, this, is, uh, th that this is part of who you are. And now in some cases, it's just flat out denial or, 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 or flat out repression. Um, you know, just pushing it down and trying not to pay any attention to it. Um, the paranoid person is less likely to just repress it, repress it, and they're more likely to project it and perceive, in, like in the case of a male, uh, a, pers a, a male person who has per significant paranoid character structure, is likely to perceive the men to whom he feels unconscious attraction as being possible sexual predators, and as of targeting him, eyeing him, um, um, being attracted to him. Um, and that freaks him out. And the thing, of course, that's freaking him out is it actually isn't them. They may or may not be interested in him. Um, he is the source of the sexual interest um, that was un generally unconscious because it's so intolerable and, and then unconsciously projected. And of course, the, one of the things you get is the, 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 more, the more successful paranoid structure is going to tend to project that onto people who arguably um, are realistic um, uh, targets. Uh, so the, the paranoid person is going to perceive, the paranoid male is going to perceive as particularly threatening, particularly scary, um, any male who fits that, the, 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 the paranoid's picture of what it would mean to be gay. Uh, so it might be a man who is, who the, the paranoid guy perceives as excessively attractive or, or uh, relatively effeminate, anything that fits that profile. Uh, and if he has somebody that he, that, that he is pretty sure he has, maybe he has by reputation, perhaps, uh, he knows this person is gay. Well, that's a really good target to project all of these, these impulses on. And they are more likely to perceive the person who perhaps it is known in, in their little community, say that, you know, that guy is gay, he identifies as gay. Well, that is an easy source or an easy object, excuse me, uh, onto which he can project his own impulses. Um, and it has the additional 
benefit, I guess you could say, of being realistic. Well, that guy is gay. And then the, the paranoid person then can, it's a little easier uh, for them to rationalize that that the person is actually experiencing attraction to the person who's, who's paranoid. Um, and I'm sorry, I got talking to you about all that because I was wanting to make sure that I, that I made the point that, 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 that the, the, the shame tends to be most pronounced um, when the projected um, unacceptable impulses are sexual in nature. Um, I, I kind of already spoke to the idea that they have a, a higher innate degree of aggressiveness. We'll talk about this more. Um, people who are, have paranoid structure tend to be relatively easily overstimulated. They tend to be very strongly reactive to provocation for obvious reasons. They're already projecting aggression, so they're very sensitive to it. Um, they are, are, are very cautious and reluctant to um, give voice to their needs or, or, or give in to their needs for acceptance, nurturance, admiration because uh, of the perception that it makes them vulnerable. Um, and completely normal and natural human urges, um, the, 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 the kinds of urges that any heterosexual person would have for intimacy and closeness, emotional intimacy in particular, and emotional and physical closeness with other people, both of the opposite sex and the same sex, takes on a strong homosexual tinge for the person who is, who is paranoid. Um, and they perceive it as extraordinarily, so, so this, this normal need for closeness that may not have any, any particular sexual component to it um, is imbued with, with, uh, with sexual urge, partly because, frankly, that is what's going on underneath. Um, and so it, it kind of spreads out, it kind of permeates all urge for closeness. It, I'll, I'll be back up and put it a little bit, a, sl a slightly different way. The, the, the paranoid person who has a normal urge for, for physical and emotional intimacy um, is vulnerable to misperceiving that as necessarily sexual because they've got that sexual uh, uh, urge, the, 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 the thing that they're most afraid of, that they, the, 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 the thing that, that not infrequently, particularly males who are paranoid, are is very, very afraid of, what if I am gay? So afraid that they often will not have no awareness that that is something that they're carrying around and wrestling with. Um, and so anything that might even begin to move toward physical intimacy, uh, same-sex physical intimacy, becomes very conflictual for them uh, and very easily activates shame. And when you when you activate shame for somebody who's paranoid, it's not unusual for them to, to react fairly aggressively. That might just be verbally, so they might be verbally attacking, but they can also, it can also be physically attacking, kind of in a panic to push it away. Uh, like I said before, we started off the, the, this lecture by, by pointing out that uh, the, the defining defense mechanism for paranoid personality structure is projection. It's externalization of aggressive uh, and or sexual urges. Um, I've already kind of spoke to the fact that the paranoid person perceives in others the urges that he, and I keep saying he because you, it, you tend to see this more in males than in females, um, that, that he fears most in himself. Um, again, time for just for time's sake, we're not going to get into all the protective identification stuff. Um, but at the at the at the borderline level, the projective identification becomes much messier. At the psychotic level, it is frankly delusional, um, and we start we start actually making the diagnosis of paranoid delusions or delusional disorder paranoid type, technically. Um, the other defense mechanisms that you see prominently in people who have paranoid character structure are denial, for obvious reasons, um, and to some degree, reaction formation. Um, uh, and this would be predominantly in things like, uh, uh, well, uh, to, to go back to the to the uh, to the struggle to manage anything approaching. Um, 
uh, a homosexual urge for the paranoid uh, heterosexual male, um, they would project those urges, perceive those as threatening in other males, um, and then adopt a very kind of hyper-masculine um, demeanor. Uh, you know, so uh, the, 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 the paranoid uh, male who has projected these urges onto other males and perceives other males as sexually threatening um, would be mortified. I don't know if I can get back far enough here uh, to sit with the legs crossed in a way that they might perceive as, oh, this is a feminine way to sit. And you'd, and you'd find them just really reacting strongly if they caught themselves sitting in this way that they perceive as feminine. It would greatly disturb them and they'd have to get out of that position very quickly. Um, they, they would tend to be very sensitive to anything that might be perceived as um, as overinvested in appearance, um, as even slightly effeminate, as even slightly crossing gender roles, that sort of thing. So that, that I'm sorry, just to, make, just to clarify, that's the reaction formation that you tend to see. You, you, see that you, you also see it sometimes, although less prominently in people who are struggling with aggressive urges, uh, um, they're often a little more comfortable to be aggressive because they project their hostility. They perceive that hostility in another person, which makes it okay. Now, okay, now I can be aggressive. So you don't tend to see the reaction formation regarding the aggressive urges. You tend to see the reaction formation as a way of completely deny, reinforcing that denial of, of sexual urges. Um, oh, uh, just also to mention, because I'm talking about it predominantly in terms of heterosexuality and homosexuality, uh, another way in which you get that reaction formation uh, in paranoid structure, not around uh, denial of, of in the heterosexual male of underlying homosexual urges, you also can get it uh, in the paranoid male who is involved in a relationship with a female has the urge to become involved in a sexual relationship with somebody else, disavows that in shame, um, and instead perceives his girlfriend or his spouse as the one who is potentially going to cheat on him. Um, and further manages his own urges towards in, toward infidelity by presenting himself and, and creating a conscious picture of himself as extraordinarily loyal, right? So that would be the reaction formation in that circumstance. Shifting from uh, drive and temperament over to object relations. Um, what you see in, uh, even in early life, is that people who are, who have paranoid structure um, are often remembered by their parents and their siblings as being kind of difficult kids. Um, and it might mean, you know, just, maybe they're just colicky as a baby. And so the, so their early experience is that people don't enjoy interactions with them because they were difficult, right? And it may not be, it may not be that they're, you know, certainly in the infant, it's not because the infant is paranoid. It's because, I don't know, they're physically uncomfortable. Um, and so they're colicky, they're, 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 they're difficult to soothe. They're crying a lot. They don't like being held. They, you know, they, they arch their backs the way infants will do when they're really upset. Um, and so the, the, the adults kind of don't want to deal with that. They, and even if, and if they have to deal with that, they're, they're doing so reluctantly. And the kid picks up on this nonverbal and feels um, persecuted, feels rejected. Um, and of course, if you start off in the situation and it, it is sustained by ongoing kind of um, uh, a miscommunication or a mismatch in, in terms of demeanor um, between the parent and the child, uh, it often can carry over into things like toilet training and just general discipline um, where the adult is, is using harsher and harsher and harsher strategies to get the kid to do what the adult wants them to do. Um, the result of this is that you can you can set up a situation where the person who's actually not psychopathic or antisocial um, begins to look a little bit that way because they have when vulnerable they have been hurt and so they can become somewhat preoccupied with power uh, but the preoccupation with power in somebody who is psychopathic is gratifying they, they get a charge out of it they feel good when they can manipulate somebody or control somebody uh, the the paranoid is more likely to have a sense of, of relief, um, a sense of kind of 
discharge of tension when they can be in a position of power. They're less likely to kind of arbitrarily manipulate uh, manipulate for enjoyment. If they manipulate, they manipulate because they perceive a threat. Um, but it can be difficult sometimes to tease those things out. Somebody who's paranoid and somebody who's psychopathic uh, can, can look somewhat similar. And it's not unusual for somebody who is psychopathic to have some paranoid tendencies. Um, the, 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 the paranoid structure, paranoid character tends to be raised in, in homes um, that are relatively devoid of emotional warmth. The people, you know, the people that are raising them, the caregivers, the parents are not particularly warm and cuddly, um, are not particularly reassuring. Um, oftentimes you see in the background of people who are paranoid, one or both parents having being pretty scary people in the sense that they have unpredictable explosive tempers. So the, 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 the child early on doesn't know when the, ne when, the, when the next foot is gonna drop. Is that the right way to say it? Um, they don't know where the next bad thing is coming from. And so they're on edge a lot. Um, and even if that's not the case, uh, one, of the, one of the other characteristics that we see in the, in the background and upbringing of, of people who have paranoid structure is, is a lot of kind of passive aggressiveness in the home. Um, so the person is you know, passive aggressiveness, meaning you behave in such a way that you can disavow the aggression or you can disavow the hostility. And so, you know, the kid is stuck in this position where they're pretty certain and in all, like, in all likelihood they're reading accurately the hostility from mom and or dad. But when, if you try to approach it directly, um, it's been done in such a way that the mom and dad go, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, you know, I, w I wasn't being mean to you. All right. Like that, that's the, that's the, that's what passive aggressiveness is. It allows the person to deny that they were being aggressive. And so you can see how this would foster a paranoid position for somebody if this is kind of the kind of home that they grew up in. Um, the homes tend to be characterized by prominent sarcasm. Um, I would just as a quick aside, I would recommend to you, uh, if and when you ever get to create your own home, have your own children and marriage and so forth. Uh, I would really strongly recommend to you that you that you quickly make it a policy in your marriage and then later in your family, if you have kids, uh, that sarcasm is not welcome in the home. And I say this as somebody who tends to be pretty damn sarcastic. Uh, it, it is poisonous to raising children. Uh, it can be fun and enjoyable, uh, but it doesn't tend to create a warm, safe atmosphere because the reality is that the energy, the emotional, uh, the emotional, what would that be, um, valence uh, underlying sarcasm is anger. If you look carefully underneath sarcasm, almost inevitably is anger. Uh, and but sarcasm is somewhat I won't say it's all out passive aggressiveness, but there's a, there's a passive aggressive quality to it. It allows you to express anger without looking angry. It allows you to express anger in such a way that if a person comes back to you and challenges you on it, it allows you to disavow the anger. Um, the same thing with the teasing. Uh, the, the tease underneath teasing is is often some degree of hostility, not inevitably, but often some degree of hostility. It's a it's an easy and convenient way for somebody to discharge hostile impulses while not being held accountable. Teasing is by definition, not inevitably, but frequently by definition um, or, or by, by its nature, excuse me, passive aggressive. And so these various dynamics combine to, from an early, early age, make it difficult for the child to, to feel like they can trust the people around them, including and especially the people who are supposed to be most trustworthy, their caregivers or parents. Um, somebody who's paranoid, not likely to, they're, they're not likely to direct hostility toward themselves. Again, definitionally, they're projecting it. They're sending it out into the world. Um, so they're, they're, it's, it's unusual. It's not impossible that somebody who's paranoid might eventually suicide, but it's less common. Uh, they don't tend to be self-mutilating. They don't tend to be self-harming. Um, they are much more likely to act out aggressively towards somebody else than toward themselves. 
Um, even in close relationships, they're kind of closed off. Um, they, you know, you, you kind of have the sense with somebody who's paranoid that you get, you can get close to them to a point and no further. Um, they always seem cautious and on and on guard, even when you feel like they should know you well enough to know better. Uh, because again, they may know you well enough to know better, but their their way of interacting with people is built around um, projecting onto others their own aggression. So the person that they're reacting to is not don't they're not psychotic, right? And 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 most of the time they're not even they're not even borderline. So they have relatively good reality testing, but. To whatever degree your 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 personality is available for this projection, they're going to do it. You know, so like like I said before, I'm, I I tend to be somewhat sarcastic. I work hard to kind of minimize that and not not rely on it too much. Somebody who's paranoid would detect that sarcasm um, and tune in to any related hostility, right? Um, they, they're, 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 they're going to, even if you're not fundamentally a hostile person, and perhaps that's, you, you know, you're genuinely, you know, in, in your relationships, like you're, you're fairly gentle, you're fairly kind, and you kind of discharge whatever aggression, whatever hostility you have indirectly by being somewhat sarcastic, you know, right? Otherwise, you're a pretty kind and gentle soul. The paranoid person, despite the fact that you're a kind and gentle soul, is going to tune in to that sarcasm, and that's where the projection is going to go, right? That's the, they, they 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 focus on that part of it, um, and and they 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 are very very good. They're very. This is part of what makes them good in law enforcement. So they're very alert for threats. They monitor for threats. You know, uh, most of us. We walk in, you know, I don't know, you're, you're out somewhere in Atlanta and you walk into a bar and you realize this is kind of a shady place, you know, and if you're a smart person, uh, if you're a cautious person, um, you know, you might be checking for, you know, uh, watching to see, you know, does the person appear to be uh, carrying concealed, a concealed weapon? Um, you know, is there somebody who appears uh, high or, or unusually intoxicated and aggressive? Uh, do I have good access to escape routes? Like that, those aren't unreasonable things to look at um, in a in a perhaps a le relatively less safe uh, environment. Um, but most of us, we have to kind of consciously make that shift and focus and think about, okay, you know, where's my exit? You know, does, is this person carrying? Uh, you know, is that person right-handed or left-handed if, if, if they do present a threat, those kind of things. The paranoid person, man, they are tuned in. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to try. They're already tuned in, right? Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a lifestyle for them. It's, it, it's like a fish being in water. Um, ironically, well, not, not ironically, this does kind of make sense, um, but you don't, but, it, but it, 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 it's very well hidden when you interact with somebody that's paranoid. Um, they're their their in their core sense of being impotent of of being humiliated of being unliked or even despised by the people around them and again think about that upbringing the typical upbringing that you find for people who are, who are paranoid um, um, it, it would be it would tend to be a humiliating environment and, and you got to think about it what an awful way to what an awful childhood and adolescence to, to be in a home where people fundamentally, for whatever reason, don't like you. And there can be all sorts of reasons that, that maybe you didn't even precipitate. You know, maybe it was you were born into a household. Uh, you, you were born and into a household. And uh, shortly after you were born, your biological father abandoned the mom. Uh, the mom, who really didn't want to be pregnant in the first place, got pregnant. The 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 dad, your, your biological dad convinces her to have you, you know, convinces your, her to go through with the pregnancy and have the child, uh, and then abandons her. And now this woman is left with a child that, that you know, perhaps they have a, a reasonable maternal warmth for, it, but you, but she didn't originally want to have the child. Her life now is substantially different from how she thought it would be. The man left her. He's not available for her to be mad at anymore. So where does that anger go? Well, it gets focused. It, 
potentially could get focused on the child whom she already resents somewhat anyway. Not a bad mom, not a bad person, feels uncomfortable with this dynamic and wishes she didn't feel this way, so she tries to hide it. It comes out somewhat passive-aggressively. Passive it comes out in stressful situations, but the undercurrent is always there, and the kid may not even be able to put his or her finger on it, but the kid at some level is aware of it, is aware of not fundamentally being wanted and maybe not wanting, wanting to be liked. And if you treat somebody from the very outset as if they're not wanted and as if they're not liked, they're, they're going to become less likable because they become paranoid. Right, so you can see how this can happen fairly subtly um, and how you can have an adult who spends his or her whole life experiencing themselves as, as relatively powerless, humiliated, unlikable, these kinds of things. Um, and the reason why I said to you that they, that they don't tend to present this way is because that is vulnerability. So what, what you tend to get is that reaction formation where they present themselves they, they, they work hard to be competent looking, powerful. Um, uh, they, they're very cautious to put themselves in a position of advantage. Um, they glory in winning things. This is where they can look somewhat psychopathic sometimes, but they, they value their wins tremendously and they work very hard to get the wins because um, it that goes a long way toward helping them deny the underlying sense of impotence and unlikability. Um, but the problem is, is that they, they, they don't fundamentally buy this reaction formation and they, they can't avail themselves of the things that would genuinely disprove um, these, these self perceptions of impotence and humiliation because you know, the way you disprove those things is you become involved in, a, in an intimate relationship where you learn to trust the other person and you get warmth, affection and tenderness from them but they can't allow that to happen, or it's very difficult for them to allow that to happen. Um, and so no relief is found. I already kind of spoke to this. Sometimes you'll get this kind of grandiosity where the, where the paranoid person, understandably, given the dynamics that are involved here, kind of senses that everything is about him or her. Um, uh, it, it often, one, it's often unconscious or, or at least pre-conscious. It's, it's, it, it's, not as, as, it's not real obvious to the person. And two, if you got them to talk about this, if you can do this in psychotherapy and you get to them, get, if you can help them come to recognize that they are mistakenly assuming that everybody is looking at them, um, what they'll tell you is, fairly, it's not pleasant. The, 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 the sense that everything is about you uh, for the paranoid person is not a positive thing, it's a bad thing. Uh, now, it's still somewhat megalomaniacal, right? Because the world isn't all about you. Um, but uh, when, you, when you try to, uh, certainly if you do it uh, um, brusquely, um, and even if you do it somewhat carefully in psychotherapy, uh, you get a real big pushback from the person because what they'll essentially say to you is, why in the world would I want it to be about me? I don't like this, and that's, pretty understandable. Um, and then we, we kind of already talked about the fact that there's that there's a, 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 a clear developmental relationship between what's going on around issues of control and uh, the, 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 the style of the caregiver and the development of paranoia. Uh, it's not unusual at all to find somebody um, who has paranoid personality structure to have had a fairly unpleasant uh, early experience around, say, toilet training, which they may or may not remember, um, but also other things where the parents were making an effort to get them to fit a, a picture that the kid maybe wasn't ready or able to fit in terms of trying to control the child. Okay, um, I this is the last slide. I've already spoken at length about uh, the, 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 the significance of homophobia, how it plays out in paranoid structure, the fact that it's very common, uh, especially in males, uh, in paranoid personality structure. So I'm not going to say much more. Uh, that's it. I got this one done in less than an hour. Uh, I know you must be pleased and maybe even proud of me. Uh, so I will call it a day, call it a semester. Wish you luck with studying and um, 
I would normally say I'll see you for the exam, but I won't see you for the exam because this one's going to be online. All right, well, I hope all is going well for you at the end of the semester, and good luck, good luck, good luck.